Having said all that, let's now transition to the sermon. Would you uh, join me for another prayer, please? Father in heaven, thank you for this moment. Right now, in this worship experience, you are in our midst. And so we just call upon you and we give you permission to touch our hearts. Not by me, but by the scripture we contemplate together. This topic, this series, everything we've done just now in this worship time, we give your permission, give you permission to use your power through the Holy Spirit to transform our lives, to encourage us, to direct us. May we see Jesus clearly, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. How to live life to the fullest. So we are on this journey together. And in this journey, we are learning how to live, and we are doing our best to do even better at living life to the fullest. Don't you want to live life to the fullest all the time, everywhere? Amen? And in order to live life to the fullest, we have to be healthy in all realms, not just spiritually, physically, mentally, relationally. And guess what? There's good news about this because Jesus Christ came to do something. He came not only to save us from our sins, but he came so that we can live life to the fullest now and forever. John 10, 10. That's the heart of the gospel as well. It's included in the gospel. It's part of the gospel message. Amen? I can see the smiles through your mask almost. It's good news. And so what this means then is that in our effort to preach the gospel, we need to be fine specimens of people who are healthy and living life to the fullest in all realms. And there's more good news. Because the power, the capability to be as healthy as possible and live life to the fullest is within our hands with God's help. It's possible and manageable. Manageable is a key word. It's possible to live life to the fullest and to have all of our endeavors before us guided by God. Now, one thing to be clear that we're laying out in this series and we've touched on each week, and especially in the introduction, if we have minds that are not clear enough to hear and understand God's word because we're not healthy in all realms, or as much as possible, and if our bodies are so sick, we're unable to serve and help others, then we're not not only not able to live life to the fullest, we also can't thrive as effective disciple makers. And since God has called each of you, myself included, all of us together, to make disciples, it makes sense then that God must have not left us standing with no help, right? In other words, he has given us the keys to live life to the fullest. And so we're going to explore this now together in today's topic, mental health and the church. And already maybe some are thinking, oh, this is going to be a little uncomfortable. And that's okay. And that might be so among some of you because there's still a stigma today among some people about mental health and mental illness. But I believe you will come away today encouraged and hopeful because we're coming to this topic, we're going to be exploring this point from a biblical perspective as well. Amen? And the Bible is always hopeful and helpful and what we need today. So I believe today you will come through this enriched and ready to move forward as a church in this topic as well. So first we need to set the foundation before we move into the scripture. What is mental health? Do you know what mental health is? Well, Mental health, in a nutshell, is the ability to to effectively thrive in common day activities that result in productive activities like work and school and, and caregiving and the ability to adjust to change and to cope with hardships. And then on the other end is mental illness. Mental illness is what happens collectively when you diagnose a mental disorder, which is really a health condition that involves severe, dramatic, 
major significant changes in thinking and emotions and behavior that also result in conflict and, and difficulty dealing with these same everyday activities like school and work and even family life and social life. And of course, there's a whole scale of minor to extreme mental illness and unwellness. So for example, for example, if I spend all season long rooting for a football team who doesn't have Tom Brady as their quarterback, then when they lose the championship, I'm going to be depressed. Maybe you, by the way, uh, somebody's a Cowboys fan because we found a Cowboys keychain out in the parking lot last weekend. So sorry about that too. You're going to be depressed at the end of the season when they lose, right? You understand. I'm just joking. Whichever team you follow, I might get depressed when the team loses. However, that isn't necessarily a mental health concern. Yeah, we get depressed. That, that happens. But if that depression lingers day after day, and then I'm unable to, to get up and face the day and deal with my activities and responsibilities and don't want to take a shower and, and go to work and, and help out and care for others and for myself, then it becomes a mental illness of some degree which a health expert can help me assess. That's when it becomes disorderly. And so mental illness, in other words, is part of our world's health burden. It's everywhere. It does not discriminate whether you are a devout follower of God or not. In fact, all Christians deal with the same disorders from time to time that the general population does. They're not all at once, of course, and not all of us would experience the same thing, but the same issues can touch us as well, even though we're devout followers of God. Depression, perfectionism can be a mental disorder. Addiction, issues around fear and acceptance and identity. Some have experienced abuse. Others have experienced abandonment, hopelessness, or, get this, we're going to unpack this next one in the coming weeks. A reluctance to forgive is tied to a mental disorder. And because of the connection between our minds and our bodies, unhealthy thinking can ch cause a chain reaction and actually cause physical illness and disease. In other words, our mental health is essential to maintain and manage. And praise the Lord, it's manageable. However, as I've mentioned, mental health is, me mental illness, mental health disorders, are a burden in the entire world, but let's bring it now locally. The National Institute of Mental Health notes that about one in five adults suffer from a diagnosable mental disorder in a given year, and about half of all adults will experience a mental disorder at one time or more in their lives. At some point of various lengths of illness and degrees. So in other words, Mental disorder is the number one cause of disability in the U.S., in North America. And that makes sense because our identity is wrapped up in our emotions, in our thinking, in our minds, in our attitudes. In other words, a broken leg or the need for surgery or other physical ailment is not seen the same way as a broken spirit. So this is a serious, significant item that we're exploring today in this series, how to live life to the fullest. How do we have mental health to the fullest? How does the church come into play here? Because it's mental health and the church. So let me rewind a moment and get back to the identity that's wrapped up in our minds and our emotions, our thinking and the behaviors that all of that produces. So our identity, it's, it's from the mind, that's what makes us so unique as human beings. So speaking about this and doing the research for this series and especially for today's sermon, I came across this article I want to share with you because it, it really illustrates this point about our identities and the stigma associated with mental health and mental illness. Now, it's from a famous magazine 
GQ, Gentleman's Quarterly. Now, I know it's not a scientific journal. I, I get it. But even so, it really encapsulates a point I want to share with you, okay? So I also found it humorous because the author, Lauren Bands, female, she writes about the issue of when or when not, when, when guys can cry or when they should not cry in public, okay? So that's dealing with emotions. That's dealing with mental health. When can men shed tears? And here's how she introduces this article. Male crying is not new. It's been happening for as long as men have had eyeballs. But it was almost always done behind at least three closed doors. Does that make sense? So are you ready for GQ's rules about public crying for men? Okay, you ready? Here's, here's one rule. It is okay to cry if you are in extreme pain, like say a piano falls 50 stories high onto your foot. If you're going to cry from pain, it has to be at least an eight on the pain scale, okay? That's the only time you can cry if you're a guy. Here's another rule. It is okay to cry at certain works of art or film. For instance, she writes, if you don't get misty eyes at Toy Story 3, then you're a monster. Okay? Toy Story 3. Great, great movie. It's almost weird if you don't sob the first time you hold your newborn baby. She writes, no shame in that, bro. That's okay to cry about. Now, it's definitely weird if you sob during a sports event. Although you can cry if you're actually out on the field as one of the athletes, but even then, you should cry only if you win. And if you're just a fan, the rule here is much simpler. Never, ever cry. And finally, never, ever cry during an argument. As this female author writes, sorry guys, but crying during an argument is kind of our thing. So that shares with you and that helps illustrate this point that many men don't want to share their emotions or be identified as criers or emotionally soft. And that's because our identity is found in our minds, our emotions, our attitudes, which is tied hand in hand with our behaviors and our mental health. And if we feel stigmatized in any way, then we feel we're not seen as normal. But this is a worldwide phenomenon, whether you're male or female. And today I hope we can break down the stigma. I hope today we can see biblically and realize that we are in this all together. It's okay to cry. It's okay to go through these struggles. We are human. We're all emotional beings, and we're all going to go through this from one time to another. For long periods of time and shorter periods of time, it just depends. The degree of mental illness in our community is something we have to deal with. Everybody here today and watching at home is dealing with mental illness one way or another. If not in yourselves going through something, someone in your family is going through something. But there's hope in this because, as we've already stated, God, Christ came to show us the way to live life to the fullest now, today, and forever. Before and after the second coming. Of course, after the second coming, everything is going to be completely perfect. We won't have to go through these struggles. Now you might be wondering, and I'll go back to this question again. What does the church have to do with mental health? Well, you might also be wondering, what's the church doing talking about this? We're supposed to be preaching about the gospel. And does mental health have anything to do with the gospel? And what about Mental Health Awareness Month? Should the church be involved in mental health awareness beyond just this month? Well, in order to answer all of this, we really need to focus especially on what Scripture is saying and, and comprehend the mission of the church and see if mental health and wellness in the life 
fits into the life and mission of the church. So are you ready to do this now for a few moments? We're going to explore biblically how mental wellness, mental health, fits into the mission of the church. And in order to do this, it's necessary for us to inquire specifically about this and to also not just focus on the general answer. But specifically, we want to see how God demonstrates his attention and his desire and his care for our mental health as individuals, as a church, and as a community. Okay, are you ready? All right, you can get out your Bibles now. You can watch the screen too a bit. Make sure I've typed everything in correctly. So the first one, we're not going to read verse by verse, but the, the first highlight of God's interest in our mental health, it's in Genesis 1. And you know what happened there? Before we were even created, before there were human minds to even interact with one another, God set up the perfect environment for us, a place where we could thrive, that could sustain life, and provide for us meaning and purpose and work and provide for relationships. And then he created Adam and Eve and the rest is history until sin came in and messed up that beautiful symbiotic relationship. And then God had to step in and save us because that balance was broken immediately. The purpose and, and the work and the relationship and meaning and and. God restored, began his restoration process, which will ultimately happen completely at the second coming, but he demonstrated he would save us from some of this trouble through his sacrifice. He came to the rescue. So that's the first dimension that shows that God cares about our emotional health, our mental health, because he came there right away to try and fix the imbalance that was created from sin. He was there to support them to comfort them. Even Cain, who, who was beside himself, he, he was worried, he was stressed because he felt he would have a mark on him for the rest of his life and he needed help and God helped him in his distress too as a wicked murderer even. So God cares for all of us in our mental health. The Exodus is another story. You can fast forward to the whole book. You know the story. It's a meta-narrative. It's a large overarching theme how God provides for the wellness and care of the entire nation of Israel, right? God comes in and responds to all of their needs. He is committed to Israel then. He's committed to the church today and to each of you individually and corporately. He is committed to the mission of providing for your needs. He is concerned about all human needs, and that was demonstrated in Israel. They needed food, they were homeless, they were orphans, they were immigrants, they were poor, they were sick, and what did he do all along during that 40 years of wandering? And then when they came into the promised land, again, they had to fight for their residency. Tribes coming and attacking them, he provided for their needs. See, God responded to all the dimensions of Israel's needs, And our commitment to to mission as a church, your commitment to mission as a Christian, should also encompass all dimensions of need in the community and those around you. If God's committed to all of the needs, physically, emotionally and mentally, relationally, spiritually, financially, and and everything in between, then we should be as well. Our commitment to mission should be the same broad totality and concern as is God's. Let that sink in. Ours should be the same broad totality as well as God was concerned for Israel's well-being. And guess what? You know, the things that were commanded of Israel that were literal and local back then become spiritual and worldwide and applicable even today in many regards. So what he commands Israel then becomes great advice for us today and an example of how we can respond to the needs of the worlds around us. Let me go on to the next slide here. 
Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 22. I'm reading from the Common English because I like how it flows. It's a very accurate translation from the major from all of the materials available, which the old King James didn't have when they originally translated this. So this really brings in a smooth, accurate reading of many of the passages I'll be using today. Common English, Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 22. Look at what he commands Israel to do in caring for the needs of others. Whenever you are reaping the harvest of your field and you leave some grain in the field, don't go back and get it. Let it go to the immigrants, the orphans, and the widows so that the Lord your God blesses you in all that you do. Similarly, when you beat the olives off of your olive trees, don't go back over them twice. Let the leftovers go to the immigrants, the orphans, and the widows. Again, when you pick the grapes off of your vineyard, don't pick them over twice. You get it. What's he going to say next? Let the leftovers go to the immigrants, the orphans, and the widows. And so this is designed for, e for Israel to remember that they were slaves in Egypt. So as a, as a response to salvation and freedom and restoration, they then respond by helping immigrants, widows, and orphans. That's why I'm commanding you to do this. And so if they were commanded to do that, it implies that we are also obligated to fulfill this because this was part of the Old Testament mission and commission. Now, this was a big ask. This was a big ask back then because there's a lot of value even in that leftover crop, the grain, the fruit, olives are a fruit, by the way, and grapes, of course. And so this was essential for those who were poor. And I, I realized that firsthand in my experience as a research assistant studying the wine grapes of the San Joaquin Valley. And the fruit trees there are abundant, the vines and fruit trees. Did you know that farmers take out crop insurance because they're so valuable? And they base the value on the life expectancy of an average vine or fruit tree and the amount of crop it will produce in its lifetime, which means be careful if you're driving your car crazy in the San Joaquin Valley because if you slide out the road and take out a bunch of vines and fruit trees, you owe somebody something, either the insurance company or the farmer, for all of that loss of crop until the new vines can be planted and become mature enough to replace what it lost. So there was, this was a big ask of Israel to give of the leftover. But they needed to do it because this was essential to the life and support of the poor. These were destitute people. This isn't a group of people that just lost a few points on their stock values or had some depreciation on their property values. No, these are destitute, suffering people, immigrants, widows, widowers, orphans, with no ability to provide for the sustenance of life. And with this, we know, comes stress, depression, mental illness, and suffering, despair. They're at their wit's end. And so when you read in Scripture that the poor are to be helped, it's not only that they're poor. They are on the verge of a mental breakdown. They could be in great despair. And so God cares for everyone and especially cares for our mental wellness. So much so that they're called, Israel was called to help. So when the Bible talks about poverty, it's referring to people who are destitute. In other words, poverty is not just an economic dimension. It's actually, more importantly, a mental health issue. And that's why it's of such an interest for the church to be involved, for each of us to be involved in helping with the poor because it helps improve mental wellness. Notice 2 Corinthians, our scripture passage today. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. May the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ be blessed. He is the compassionate Father and God of all comforts. See that? He's the one who comforts us in all our trouble. Not, it's not talking about only losing a paycheck or getting unemployed. It's, it's what comes with this, the lack of mental health, the mental distress. He is the one who comforts our depression, our despair, despair, our fear, our anxieties, 
our obsessive compulsive tendencies so that we can comfort other people who are in every kind of trouble. So he comforts us, he'll comfort you. We get better. We have a a story to share, some tips to help to be there as a confidant, a trusted compadre, a helper, a friend to help comfort others as we have been offered the same comfort that we ourselves receive from God. Amen? The followers of Jesus are invited to comfort others just as we are comforted by God. He provides for our mental wellness. And so now, just just already, just as quickly as we've gone through this, we're already getting the point. We're seeing an overview of how God values our mental health, that to live life to the fullest, we need to be healthy in all realms, including mentally, and that God cares about it. It's of interest. It's deep at the heart of mission. So let's keep on this track for a moment. Jesus is a great example of his life and ministry while he was walking on this planet. I mean, he's always the best example on how to do things, right? So why not explore some of Jesus' work and ministry? You know, he he came on the scene, he begins preaching, and he described himself as the Son of God, the Son of Man, coming in all his glory. And then in Matthew 25, he begins to talk about in times and the judgment. And he describes himself as, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked, I was a stranger, I was an immigrant, I was sick, I was in prison. And then the folks ask, well, when did we see you like this? When did we help you like this? And he says, if you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. So he, he's showing that he identifies with our suffering, with the mental unwellness that we experience from time to time or all the time, depending on our situation. He, was, he suffered, he was poor, he was an immigrant, he was homeless, he was anguished, he was crying, he was emotionally distraught, he had ups and downs in life. He did all of this and was willing to do this because he cares for you, for all of you, individually and collectively. So that's one place we see Christ's specific role in mental health and his concern for our mental health and wellness. Matthew eleven twenty eight is another example. Come to me, all you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Now, the heavy load is not just the burden of sin. It's the burden of anguish and brokenness and suffering. The burden of mental illness. The burden of depression, of anxiety from time to time or all the time. These burdens are included in the struggle, the load we carry. And Jesus is saying, come to me, I've been through it. I have some answers for you. I will help you along the way. Isn't this good news? This This is hopeful. This is powerful. This gets me excited. I hope it's getting you excited because I'm sure you're thinking of someone you need to comfort and and guide them in their anguish, in their hopelessness, and show that Jesus does care about all of our fears. And it doesn't matter how close or far we are from God. He cares for all of us the same. Amen? This ability to thrive and live life to the fullest is available to all humankind. It's not just the burden of of sin. It's the burden of trauma, tragedy, and loss. And so these are our go-to passages in the mental health talk theologically. Just a few of the many we go to to describe God's concern for our mental wellness, that he cares for these circumstances, and Jesus wants us to help share this with others, to be his agents, his ambassadors, his disciple makers, so that we can share the hope that we have as we go through struggles with others as well. But, you know, there's even more we can understand from, from Christ's ministry, okay? So this, this is by far, this next one is, is my favorite. It takes the cake. It's powerful. It encapsulates so many teaching points. We could do a whole series on it. I'm not going to do that right now, but turn to Mark chapter 10, okay? Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 54 is a very succinct story, but it's powerful. It's about a guy named Bart. Jesus and his followers 
came into Jericho. And as Jesus was leaving Jericho together with his disciples and a sizable crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, Timaeus' son, was sitting beside the road. Are you there following along? When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was there, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. So he shouts this, but many scolded him, telling him, be quiet. You know what he did? He shouted even louder, son of David, show me mercy. Jesus stopped. The universe stops when Jesus stops. Jesus, stop. Call him forward. They called the blind man. Be encouraged. Now their attitude has changed all of a sudden. Get up. He's calling you. So this blind man, Bartimaeus, throws his coat to the side. He can't see, but he jumps up and came to Jesus even so in his distress. So he comes to Jesus, and Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? What is it that I can do for you? How can I help you? The blind man said, Teacher, I just want to see. I want to see. And Jesus said, Go. Your faith has healed you. Amen? Isn't this powerful? Your faith has healed you. And at once he was able to see, and he began to follow Jesus on the way. Now, this is powerful. The reason this is one of my favorites, if not the favorite healing miracle of Jesus, is because it's multidimensional here in this situation. First, Jesus, in healing Bartimaeus, he deals with a specific issue that is relevant today. He dealt with the multitudes and the minorities, the multitudes and the minorities in this situation. I mean, we live in this today, right? Got to have big numbers, big attendance, lots of uh, Facebook lights and, and followers and success and, and crowds. And that's how we rate our value today. But Jesus came in and arrested our attention and, and distracted us from that consuming interest and dealt with the minority. Minorities are important to Jesus even more so than the crowds. He stopped and paid attention to this one lovely soul who needed him at that moment. That's powerful. That, that's rich. And we can stop right there and say amen and go home. Jesus cares for minorities. He cared for blind Bartimaeus. Now remember, this is multidimensional. The second dimension that Jesus unpacked in this healing ministry in this moment raises the issue. It raises some tension. It raises some tension between the spiritual and the secular, between theology and sociology, because you see the crowds here, it was, there was a sizable crowd with Jesus. He's leaving Jericho. This crowd's following him. He's famous. He's, he's like a rock star, a movie star, a celebrity. The crowd's with them, and blind Bartimaeus is calling out, Son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. Now, everyone could hear that same cry. But you see, to the multitude, to this crowd, to them, it was of, they thought it was of no concern to Jesus. It was not a spiritual concern to them because they thought Jesus didn't care about it because... They thought Jesus didn't care about this concern because they didn't care about it. So their own point of view clouded what they thought of Jesus. But Jesus says, uh-uh, uh-uh, this is just as important to me as these other great concerns. The distinction between religion and relief is often segregated and separated. And Jesus said, no, they shouldn't be. Religion and relief go together. See, the burning issues of the day for all of those followers that were following Jesus was, what's your prophetic interpretation? How well are you keeping the law? How well are you keeping the Sabbath? How much tithe are you giving? How long are you serving each day? But to Christ, not that those things are unimportant, he's saying the relief of this blind man and his suffering emotionally and mentally and physically is just as important. They need to go hand in hand 
sociological and theological. Hand in hand, the crying need of humanity to those crowd, the crowds of people was relegated to the periphery of life. But to Jesus, he's saying, bring it back in. It's that essential to me that I stop right now. He shows that the theology and service belong together. That the cry of Bartimaeus, his suffering, his poverty, his unemployment, sickness and hunger, injustice, are religious problems. It's a religious problem. In other words, the church has every business and should be involved in helping people with this type of suffering. Jesus demonstrated that all of human need is his business. It was his business then. It still is today. That means it's the church business today too and your business and mine. Amen? And that's good news because we have the tools and the secrets that aren't even secret anymore. We have the Adventist health message straight from Scripture to help us with, with this because it's our business too. Look at Luke chapter 4. Okay, ready? You're going to do some flipping? I've got a digital Bible, so see if you can be faster with your analog. Luke chapter 4. See, this shows it's Jesus' business. Luke 4, 18 through 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. To do what? He sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And we are to do what Jesus does. So this is our, these are our marching orders as well, to liberate the oppressed, to heal others, to be there for support. And lastly, another dimension that Jesus brings out, that we can bring out in this story, is the tension between the momentary and the momentous. The momentary and the momentous. Jesus stopped everything for that moment to pay attention to a minority, to Bartimaeus. Oh, and you got to understand where Jesus was going to from Jericho and what point in his life this was. This is Jesus' last journey to Jericho. This was a momentous event. These are the final days of Jesus' ministry on earth before his crucifixion. He's preparing now to have his disciples get the colt and donkey so he can go into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He's on his way to be a sacrifice for you and me. And he says, hold on a moment. Let's stop that momentous event, the greatest prophecy of all time that's most essential, even greater than the Ten Commandments and the Sabbath, because those are all null and void, it says, if Jesus hasn't, been di hasn't died in our place and risen again. So that was the greatest momentous event, and Jesus stopped his work to handle Blind Bartimaeus' issue for a moment. Amen? The tension between the momentary and the momentous. All the strands of his teaching, the great focus of prophecy is about to be unraveled and revealed there in Jerusalem, and he stops to help blind Bart. And that single moment would have been, it would have been unnoticed by everybody in the midst of those throngs had Jesus not said, hold on. Quiet down. I love this man too. He needs my help. They, the crowds wouldn't have heard it because they were so enthralled with end time prophetic preaching and teaching. See, they were, is he going to overthrow the Romans? Is Jesus going to go into Jerusalem and, and take over? Is he going to become the king? Everyone was enthralled about these prophetic things. And in other words, this story shows us that a consuming interest now, let me be clear, a consuming interest in the proclamation of end time events can distort our vision of service in the here and now. A consuming interest can distort our vision of service in the here and now. Okay? That's essential. That's crucial. Mental health in the church is part of our mission, but a consuming interest, amazing facts, is a great ministry for end time teachings and 28 fundamentals, but it's a ministry. It's a tool. It's a resource. It's not a model of how to be the church. It's part of what we need to teach, but the totality of church is being you, a relational being. 
that helps others with their struggles and says, I too suffer with mental illness, but I'm working through it. Here's my tips on how to manage, how to make steps to get more whole. It's a day by day journey and struggle. Amen? But we get through it. So this is just a brief survey now. I know there's a lot more to go through, and we've got a second part to today's sermon next week. It's just a brief survey that indicates, I hope it shows you clearly how concerned Jesus is for your mental health. Amen? He stops everything to take care of you, to take care of us as a church. This is a picture of God's consuming interest in our well-being, in our community's well-being, in your family's well-being. And it should be something we are consumed with as well, relating to mental health matters. So what can we do about this? How can we keep on track with today's focus? Well, it's simple. There's a lot of points. I'm going to stop here with this point. We just need to keep on track with the prophetic vision for evangelism that's clear in Scripture, the prophetic vision for evangelism as a church, which is, in other words, we need to aim to fulfill the whole deal. It's not only about conducting seminars and giving Bible studies. There's more to it all, as we're seeing today. The prophetic vision for evangelism as Seventh-day Adventists, as Christians, is based on the biblical mission called the Great Commission. Now, you know that, right? You're always saying, yeah, I know that. Matthew 28. Go, therefore, into all the world, baptizing, teaching, making disciples, right? Well, that's not the only commission. Matthew 25 is another commission. The judgment scene. Because of salvation, we're grateful to help feed and clothe and help the poor and suffering and those who are mentally ill and ill and distressed. And that's a commission to do those things as a, out, of, out of response to our salvation and help. That's a, the second commission. The third commission is also in the Old Testament. Zechariah 8.23 Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days ten men from all the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of the Jews saying, let us go with you for we have heard that God is with you. See that's Old Testament evangelism that that moves forward in time to today. You see, in other words, as we live life to the fullest as prime examples of healthy beings that are doing our best to thrive in all realms and to do this relationally as well, build up relationships, help people with their needs and their suffering and guidance, that then eventually leads to Bible studies and, and people attending and worshiping with us. But before all of that, before all of that, we are filling fulfilling the Great Commission. It's all part of the gospel message as we are prime examples of beings doing our best to live life to the fullest in our salvation. We're not saved by that. Because we're saved, we aim to live this way. So I ask you this in closing. How will we be known? You know, we were gone for over a year. Our neighbors didn't really miss us because they're not embedded in what we do here unless you know some of the neighbors and they come over to your home it was just a lot quieter here on the weekends and a whole lot more parking. But if something were to happen again and we were to disappear for a time, what would be missed? What would we be known by? At that time, would it be our prophetic interpretations or professionally designed multimedia virtual experiences or by the quality of our relationships and our lives? In other words, by the quality of our lives and our interactions with others. Among all of those, what do you think is most important? Why, it's the latter. The quality of our lives and the quality of our relationships with others. This is how we make a difference in this vast urban environment that we're all connected to. This is what is essential as we move forward in evangelism, improving our lives, and improving the quality of relationships with others. In February 1954, a Navy pilot set off from his aircraft carrier in his plane into the wild dark yonder. It wasn't blue, it was nighttime. It was stormy. And just as he lifted off, this aircraft carrier was near Japan, 1954, just as he lifted off, his directional finder conked out. And then... He lost track of the ship, and then all the lights in his cockpit shorted out. So now he's completely lost, 
and the darkness of the sky and the sea came into his cabin, and he was disoriented. And just as fast, he, his training, years of dedication came to play, and he looked out as much as he could down over the edge of his cockpit, cockpits completely enclosed in, but he was able to see the ocean, and it kicked in his training. He was able to see a faint blue-green light in the ocean, and he knew exactly what it was. Oh, it was help, but it was only the help you use when you're the most desperate and when everything else fails. It was the blue-green light of photophosphorescent algae that the aircraft carrier was churning up in its wake miles away and so he followed that he followed that to his salvation to his rescue now this pilot was none other than jim lavelle one of the apollo future apollo 13 astronauts jim was saved by light he was led to safety by photophosphorescent Dinoflagellates, small light emitting organisms. This is rich. You are light emitting organisms called by God to lead people to their salvation, to their restoration, to their good health, to being able to live life to the fullest. They're going to pull on the hem of your garment saying, I want what you have. I want to live life as richly as you have it. To not fear as much as others, to, to manage just to have a loving, accepting community where I am not stigmatized because of my mental health or lack of it. You are called, we are called to be light to the community. And so as every eye is closed and head bowed, I just invite you as a church and those at home, if it's your commitment to be light, to sh continue to improve your lives and the quality of your relationships and to be part of restoring even mental wellness in our community, ourselves, in our church. Would you just raise your hand? Show you want to be part of this. And next Sabbath, we will explore how we can take part in this, how the church can be an effective community that helps restore mental health. Father, I pray for all of these commitments. I pray for our mental health as each of us is touched in some way or another with mental distress, ups and downs in life, help us through it. Help us to see the resources we need, have it be available, to have a listening ear, a professional, whatever is need, guide us, give us patience, remove the stigma, and in our next install, help, help all of us be available to listen and participate, to see how the church can be involved in restoring and bringing about change in this community, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.